that. So hello, everyone. I'm uh, Kerry Emanuel. I'm a professor of atmospheric science and climate at MIT, where I've been teaching for 40 years. And I'm very interested in the physics of climate and climate change. And I'm also very interested in trying to, to mitigate climate change. So can you tell us, Dr. Emanuel, when the first time you realized you actually you really cared about the changing climate. Can you tell us about when you made that realization and what led you to it? Well, I came into this whole issue of climate change kind of through the back door scientifically. I was always interested in meteorological phenomena, both in middle latitudes and the tropics. And uh, maybe five or six years after my PhD, I became interested in, in tropical cyclones and the theory that governs their behavior and particularly their intensity. And while I was working on that, I realized that the theory uh, predicted rather unequivocally that if you warm the climate, you ought to be able to get more intense hurricanes, not necessarily more frequent ones, but more intense hurricanes. And so I got interested in that. And I was surprised by the magnitude of that. And now uh, 30 some odd years after I published that theory, it's um, become evident that hurricanes around the world are indeed getting more intense. That's how I got interested. Definitely something um, that is something on a lot of people's minds that live along coasts, um, you know, and, and, and deal with that on a regular basis. Uh, as one of the first experts to start ringing these alarm bells, uh, tell us about some of your early days that you were speaking publicly about the changing climate um, and how is your approach your advocacy approach changed over time, if it has. Yes, well, like many uh, professors in academia, we feel an obligation to varying degrees to, um, to do public outreach. And I had bothered to educate myself about climate physics and I've been teaching a course in climate physics for over 20 years now. I thought maybe I should just go out and give some public talks. And I started talking to, by invitation to church groups and YMCAs and just other organizations that were interested in that. And I approached this originally from the idea that what people were really interested in is the science because I'm interested in science. So I talked to them about science and I would also talk to them about risks. So I sort of learned that uh, to get people to really get be interested in the science and in, in doing something about climate change, you had to uh, make them optimistic, legitimately optimistic about efforts to curtail that. And, and I start my talks these days with a simple sentence that risk is, is uh, also opportunity. Where there's risk, there's opportunity. And we have an opportunity to make lives better uh, and conquer ch climate change. And I find audiences are very receptive to that idea. Building off of that, how have you seen the, the general public attitude towards the changing climate change over time? Um, you know, you talk about how you, you spoke with specific groups and you saw them becoming more receptive and talking about opportunities to, uh, you know, build new and better things. Um, but generally speaking, how do you how do you see the attitude changing? Well, I think there's been a slow but gratifyingly steady um, increase in the acceptance of the idea that we are incurring risk to our children and, and their descendants in not doing anything about this. So I see a sort of a slow increase. Sometimes it's fast. I mean, if people live in a place that's been hammered by an unusual storm or a wildfire, they correctly or incorrectly attribute that to climate change and they're suddenly on board. And I remember distinctly going to talk to a very conservative politically conservative organization at their invitation down in Florida. It was uh, Miami Beach, I believe. And I thought based on my previous experience that there would be a lot of pushback, but not a single one of those people had any doubt that climate change was serious because they were getting flooded all the time. So yeah. I think, you know, my feeling, Renee, is that all climate change is local. To, to take off from Tip O'Neill's equivalent statement about politics, that people are worried about what's going to happen to them in their locality. And when they see things happen locally, uh, they, they become more concerned. It's a really good way of putting it. It's hard to understand really huge 
macro level issues sometimes when you see it happening in your own community or your own backyard, you know, in some cases it becomes a lot more understandable more quickly. Yes, indeed. So what do you think will be necessary in order for us to achieve meaningful progress in the fight against the changing climate? Well, the first thing is what we've been talking about. We've got to get public opinion to start putting pressure on governments to, to do something about this. It is going to take a coordinated effort at state and national levels in the US and, and equivalent levels around the world. It's not something we're going to, to cure by changing our light bulbs, uh, which is not to say we shouldn't do that. Uh, so I, pu get public opinion is the first step, right? And then the question is, is and this, they're, they're, they're not sequential because public opinion will also be swayed by their perception about he, how easy or difficult it is to attack the problem. Nobody wants to spend half our GDP trying to fight climate change. Not even me, me wants to spend that much. So I think we have to sort of look at the options and right where we are right now in 2021, from my point of view, uh, we have to try innovating in all kinds of different directions. I mean, there is uh, the obvious one is energy, both electrical energy and then other kinds of energy we use for industrial processes, for example. We have to try to learn how to decarbonize those uh, while making them, while not spending a lot more, maybe even less uh, energy or money on it. Uh, we have to uh, innovate, try innovating in carbon capture. Um, if you can, if you can burn natural gas and take the carbon out, uh, then there's not much downside to, to burning natural gas. There are all kinds of different ways we can deal with it. And now, because we're so slow at acting, we also have to learn to adapt to a certain amount of inevitable climate change. In that vein, you know, we're, we can talk about the, the Biden administration and what's been done already. They joined the Par the U.S. rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement earlier this year. Um, and you mentioned policy being one of the first things we really need to focus on in public opinion to move policy in the direction we need to go. From your perspective, what do you think the Biden administration should do uh, next in order to achieve some of these decarbonization goals? There are many things, but I think it's very important that Biden's administration, indeed Americans, look at the opportunity side of this and to recognize something really, really important, that all the projected growth, almost all of the projected growth in carbon emissions is coming from develop, rapidly developing countries like India and some nations in Africa, which we really hope will develop. I mean, why should we turn our backs on poverty? Why should we against, be against people trying to lift themselves out of poverty? But experience is very clear on this. To do this, they have to burn more energy per capita. It's, 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 it's impossible to lift yourself out of poverty without doing that. So there's going to be a huge growth. Well, we hope there will be a huge growth in energy in those places. And the only way, you know, we're not going to be able to go over to India or some African country and, and tell them, look, you know, sorry, the world's in trouble. You're going to have to pay a lot more for your electricity. That's not going to work. We, what we can do is to innovate in things like carbon capture uh, and production of elect electrical and other forms of energy to the point where we can sell them and this is where it's an opportunity for us, we can sell them the means of producing energy, which make perfect economic sense for them, and is green and is carbon free. This is the challenge for us. But the first uh, countries or organizations that, that are successful in meeting this challenge really are going to make a lot of money off of it too. So there, there's an opportunity as it's, there's an opportunity to actually do well economically and solve this problem at the same time. Mm. And how do you think nuclear energy can play a role in that process? Well, so the way I look at it is that the, the, the energy situation is complicated. Um, there's electrical energy, and that's, that's a big part of it, but it's not by any means all of it. There's, there are carbon emissions that come from places that have not little to do with energy, for example, mm -hmm. with agricultural practices. So we have to deal mm -hmm. 
with that on its Katie focused too narrowly on electricity, but people do. And in that realm, there's high hopes for renewables. Um, the price of solar PV and wind turbines have dropped dramatically. And that's a good thing. But the problem for all of those is they're intermittent. And it's OK at a low level, because you've got the grid with all of its um, baseload uh, generating capacity, whether it's gas or nuclear or something else, backing up this intermittency. But when you get up to around 40% of the grid being renewables, you start to have to rely on storage. And right now, storage is estimated to be too expensive to be feasible by about a factor of 10. And the experts I talk to at MIT and elsewhere don't think there's a lot of hope for that right now, for that coming down. So we hope it will, and we should we should absolutely, absolutely fund innovation in storage technology. We should fund everything, basically, that has any chance of success. But we can put all of our money in that basket. That would be foolish. We're going to have to um, realize that we're going to need a base load uh, that's, that's non-intermittent uh, to work with the renewables. And the renewables and non-intermittent base load need each other in a, an important way. And there is, it, this is why I'm a big advocate for nuclear energy, because it's carbon free. And it can back up the renewables in, in a good way. And I see that as important. Moreover, uh, if done correctly, it can also solve problems that renewables can't do uh, intrinsically, or electricity can't do, I should say, which is very high temperature industrial processes. We need something that will be able to handle that part of carbon emissions. Definitely hear you that it's there's a lot of many pieces that come together to make a decarbonized grid and all of them are worth supporting and focusing on. Um, uh, from your perspective, what are the biggest risks to progress on decarbonization? The, the impediments to progress, I think the number one impediment is the feeling of most people that it's either not necessary to, to do all of this or it's not urgent to do it, even if it's necessary, that climate change is something our children's generation will figure out or their, their children will figure out. So there's a lack of urgency about it. Um, there's a lack of recognition about the terrible human toll of fossil fuels quite apart from climate change. I mean, the World Health Organization said last year that fossil fuel combustion leads to 8.7 million deaths globally per year, 8.7 mm. million. That's a mm. terrible number uh, of premature deaths. And we ought to be doing something about that. You know, we can't, just can't ignore that. I think the problem with those deaths is that they're one at a time. They're not like some colossal accidents that get a lot of press. There's just, but a death is a death. And why should we tolerate that? So one of the impediments is not realizing that this technology, which has been so wonderful, this fossil fuel technology for advancing civilization over the last hundred and some odd years, it's reached the, you know, it has limitations and it's reached the end of its useful life. We should innovate our ways out of that, just as we innovated our ways out of relying on horses for transportation. Uh, that was a good thing too. In that vein of, of innovation and needing you know the new generation of technologies to come through in order for us to advance um you know there's also a lot of nuclear power plants across the country that are under pressure um you know economically and public opinion wise as you mentioned so if those were to close how do you see that affecting this progress that we need to make oh it will be a very big dent in progress my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that right now nuclear power supplies 20% of our electricity in the United States, mm -hmm. and the majority of our carbon-free electricity in the United States. Right. So to take that away prematurely doesn't make any sense. And there are or even environmental organizations that are not historically very pro-nuclear who are now advocating that we keep those open. The, the, the problem there is economics. Nobody can compete today with fracked natural gas. It's the cheapest thing uh, that comes along. Uh, solar and wind continue to do well, even with that, because they're being heavily subsidized. 
the nuclear has kind of been left out in the cold. The other thing is I think we need to transform public attitude toward nuclear energy. It's, there's a lot of mythology out there. So we've got to change the publicity about this. And I think, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to do that, but we've simply got at least to get the environmental organizations, which I work on very hard to understand that the risk of climate change are really, really spectacularly large compared to the risks of nuclear power. Mm. Yeah. I'm curious to know more about when you started to become supportive of nuclear energy, um, you know, going way back in, in, your, in your history, when did you realize like this is something that needs support and, and is to, should be protected? I'm curious about the thought process that led you there. Well, many, many different things. I like uh, I like solar and wind too. I, I'm mm -hmm. speaking to you from a house we have in Maine that has solar panels on our barn roof. And it's nice to watch the electricity meter go backward, but I'm also acutely aware that if everybody did this in, in our state, the power company would have a heck of a problem because they have to maintain the same capacity they always maintain for when it's dark and the wind isn't blowing, but half the time that that stuff is idle. And so it's costing a lot of money and not being used. It's, it, it's not simple. And I think what everybody is striving for is a kind of a power system in which can accommodate both renewables, but has a clean base load. That's why I, and hydro is great for that too, but there's not enough of it. Uh, it's kind of built mm -hmm. out. Uh, but the countries that have decarbonized their electricity almost thoroughly, as far as I can tell, all did so with largely combinations of hydro and nuclear power. So I'm thinking of Sweden. France, uh, Belgium, and Switzerland to start with. Yes, definitely. Good to know um, that, you know, you have solar panels on your house. A lot of folks do and are really proud of that. And it's a great move forward, but also see the need for other sources to come in and help make it so that we have a strong grid that provides regular power to everyone um, with, you know, no black scouts. And we can we kind of take advantage of turning on the light switch and the lights turning on. So a couple of last questions here about advocacy and, and grassroots uh, movement. So to, you know, Nuclear Matters is a grassroots coalition built of grassroots advocates across the country um, who are really passionate about protecting existing nuclear power and it's bringing the next generation of nuclear power to be. So in your perspective, and you talked a little bit about this when you talked about public opinion, but what is the role that grassroots advocates should play in the fight against the changing climate? I, I think it's absolutely essential, absolutely essential, because to, to make progress on this, we have to change public opinion by just telling them like it is, what the real truth is, both about climate change and about, the, about nuclear, the fact that nuclear power is safe and if done correctly, is also cost effective. And so we have to have more advocacy. I like to see more films coming out of Hollywood that are pro-nuclear rather than anti-nuclear. I'd like to see a big shift that's completely justified by the facts of the matter, right? We're facing a big real risk, climate change. It completely swamps uh, the, all, all the other risks we've been talking about. Russia and China see this future. They're racing for it. They're going to capture the $7 trillion global energy market if we let them. I don't think we should do that. And I would love to see us really get back into the game by innovation all across the board, uh, solar, wind, storage, carbon capture, and nuclear. Great. Yeah, that makes sense. We, the people who we talked about, you know, climate change is in their backyard. Um, they see it happening and um, they also have a voice that can be used to talk about the issues they're seeing and, and really push forward on what the, they see the U.S. is needing to do and policymakers is needing to do in order to address these issues. Um, that makes sense. My final question is if you could give us just one word to describe how you feel about our progress towards creating meaningful climate solutions. Slow. Mm. It's too slow. Slow, too slow. That's two words, but the, you know the point okay. being, and you made you made this point before of we need to make sure that we're 
um, doing what we can in order to get to where we need to be, and we need to do it as quickly as possible. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Emanuel. Really appreciate your perspective on this and um, you know, your history in climate science and as one of the foremost experts on this issue is really, really appreciated and valued. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today.